Good evening and welcome to the Menlo Park City Council special meeting. I am Cecilia Taylor, Vice Mayor of Menlo Park, and this is our May 30th special city council meeting. This is a hybrid meeting with city council, Menlo Park Fire District board members, staff, and members of the public participating in city council chambers. Please note public comment speaker time may be limited depending on the number of speakers on each item. Under emergency circumstances, Mayor Willison is using Assembly Bill 2449 emergency circumstances to participate in tonight's meeting under Government Code Section 5494542. And City Council Policy 20-12 20 permits non-agendized items to be added to the agenda only if the City Council makes findings that one, the need to consider the item arose after the posting of the agenda, and two, there is a need to take immediate action at this meeting of the city council. These findings must be approved by four fifths vote. If less than five members of the city council are present, the findings require a unanimous vote of those present. The item use of AB 2449 emergency circumstances arose after the posting of this agenda. Mayor Willison, please provide a general description of the circumstances relating to your need to appear remotely and disclose whether any other person over 18 years old are present in the room and the general nature of your relationship with the individual. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, thank you, everyone. I am invoking the emergency provision due to an emergency um, onset of an illness. And um, there are no people under the age of um, oh, over, there's nobody in the room with me. Um, and I apologize for not being able to be there in person with all of you. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Can I have a motion and a second to add the use of AB 2449 emergency circumstances to tonight's agenda? I'd like to make that motion. I second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Doer and a second by City Council Member Nash to add an emergency item for the use of Assembly Bill 2449 to the agenda. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none by roll call vote. Uh, City Council Member Doer? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Combs absent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Can I get a motion and a second to approve the remote participation under AB 2449 emergency circumstances? So moved. Seconded. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Nash and a second by City Council Member Doer to approve the remote participation under AB 2449 emergency circumstances for Mayor Wollison. Any further City Council question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote. City Council Member Dower? Yes. City Council Member Nash? Yes. Vice Mayor Taylor? Yes. Mayor Willison? Yes. And the motion passes with City Council Member Combs absent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Please note, I am participating in the City Council Chambers and not at 413 Ivy Drive, which was on the agenda. For members of the public in person, 413 Ivy Drive, who wish to provide public comment, please notify city staff members at the library. They can assist you with your public comment. I would like to introduce city council members present, which I think everyone is already aware of, and that is council member Doerr and council member Nash. Also we have present, oh, I'm sorry, and I, who we have absent is uh, Council Member Combs and also participating remotely is Mayor Willison. City staff present include our city manager, Justin Murphy, our assistant city manager, Stephen Stolte, our city attorney, Nira Doherty, and our city clerk, Judy Heron. From the Menlo Park Protection District, Fire Protection District board members and staff present are President Virginia Chang Corrali, Vice President Gary Bloom, Director Chuck Bernstein, Director Robert Jones, and Director Rob Solano, and the Fire Chief Mark Lorenzen. Ms. Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public and our Fire District on how the meeting will proceed? Yes, and thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, and again, welcoming everyone to our special joint meeting of May 30th, 2020. 
three for members of the public who are participating in person who wish to provide comment on an item on tonight's agenda. We ask that you complete a speaker card at that back table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. For those of our participants participating virtually, we'll ask that you engage that hand feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand after the mayor or the vice mayor calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak. And that concludes my instructions at this time. Return the meeting to vice mayor. Thank you, Ms. Heron. So the next item on, it, on the agenda is item C, special business. The first item is C1, community preparedness. And will we just go through each topic or we'll start off there, President Corrali? Yeah, I think that's fine. And I think that's fair. I think I just wanna welcome, well, thank you for welcoming us to this, the council chambers. I think the last time we had an in-person joint meeting was actually in 2019, if you can believe that. So we're very glad to be, we're glad to be here. Um, and hopefully we'll get a lot of things done. As you know, that we have a new chief, Chief Lorenzen. And so we want to welcome him and also introduce him to all of y'all because I think most of you worked with our former chief, um, Harold Chapelholm. And so Mark Lorenzen has been with us since what, a couple of years now, I think March of 2021, right? Or February of 20. Yeah. So, so um, we're very pleased that he's here. Um, so, as you noted, Mayor, Vice Mayor um, Taylor, this agenda actually um, is a, com a combined agenda um, with items from the fire district and items from uh, the city council and th things that you're concerned about. So, right now, the first item is com community preparedness. So, I don't know if the chief would like to kick that item off. But we also, let me just uh, note that we have our fire marshal, John Johnston, in the audience who's with the Fire Prevention Bureau of um, the Fire District. So he can also answer questions since most of the um, community preparedness is really under his realm. So Chief. Perfect, thank you, Director Crowley and members of the council and members of our board and members of staff in our community. Uh, my name is Mark Lorenzen. I am the Fire Chief of the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. I'll give you a short introduction. I've met most of you. Um, actually, I've met all of you now, but. I have been, um, as Director Crowley said, I started on February 7th, a year and four months ago, and feel um, incredibly fortunate. I am a resident of Menlo Park on Roble in District 4. Did I get it right, Member Nash? Yes, in, in Betsy's district. And, um, and like I said, I'm just, I feel incredibly fortunate uh, to protect the community here and since day one, I've uh, worked with city manager Murphy when he was in the interim spot. I remember meeting very early on. And, uh, you know, the, the collaboration has just been great with the city manager, with Chief Norris, uh, with your volunteer group, MPC Ready. And um, like I said, I just, I feel uh, fortunate to have landed here. That's really, I think in essence, what we're here for is to talk about common interests and collaborate on some items that are probably important to all of us and both of us as uh, different groups. On the com community preparedness front, I know this has been a big, uh, important topic. We are, I will share with you a little bit on what's happening on the fire district side. Uh, we have been um, going through a little restructuring. What used to be our Office of Emergency Management, OEM, is now, we've renamed it, we lost all of our staff and renamed it and put it under Chief Johnston, who's our fire marshal. And it's now our community engagement and resilience team. We are, we have hired a community volunteer coordinator. coordinator. We uh, have participated in quite a few listening events and attended a number of different things with MPC Ready, ADAPT. Lynn Bramlett has fortunately set up a, a couple of community meetings over at Trinity Church that we've participated in, which have been really helpful. And uh, one of our first steps through the support of the board was to hire a community volunteer coordinator. And really the purpose of that was to help us con connect all of our volunteer communities. So we are in the process of uh, rebuilding what is in essence our emergency preparedness unit. And by hiring some new staff, we're working on hiring another person that will come in and help us a little bit more on the training side. And really our goal is, is to first of all, support our three communities 
plus the unincorporated areas of the county to ensure our residents are as prepared as they can be and as resilient as they can be for whatever comes next. As we all saw on New Year's Eve, we had some torrential rains. We saw the creek come up and over into areas of Menlo Park in East Palo Alto and then proceeded to see a couple of different instances where we lost power for, for days on end, really impactful to our communities. Um, and it, I think it was also some foreshadowing of how much more we still need to prepare and help our community become resilient, self-dependent and dependent on each other. And we're looking forward to working with the council, whatever uh, the city of Menlo Park ends up developing in those you know, terms for emergency preparedness and, and supporting and really trying to help our communities uh, like I said, be more prepared tomorrow than they are today. So, and then one final thought in closing, and it's always a, a unique thing. I, I was a fire chief in a fire district down in Southern California, and uh, I tried to make sure every time I met with city councils, uh, just to um, really say, we are your city's fire department. We are your local fire department. Even though we're governed by an elected board of directors, uh, we really are your city fire department and we want to make sure that we feel like that. And so, I mean, that's part of the reason why we're uh, here meeting tonight and why we've had such great collaboration to this date. So thank you. Hopefully that teed it up. So thanks, Chief. I just want to introduce the Emergency Preparedness Committee from the board because we we feel like it's an important enough issue that um, it's a standing committee. So the chair of that committee is Vice President Bloom, and um, the other person on the board uh, on the committee is Director Chuck Bernstein. So um, I think that they bring a combination of experience um, professionally and actually voluntarily that they you know, understand what the community needs might be. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can obviously call the chief, me, or well, Director Bloom or um, Director Bernstein as well. And I apologize for the interruption, but uh, through the vice mayor and the board president, um, can we open up public comment for our special business items? Yes, thank you. Um, so in accordance with the Brown Act, members of the public may provide comment to any item on the agenda. And so at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on any of the special business items, C1, Community Preparedness, C2, Fire Station 1 at 300 Middlefield Road, C3, Caltrain Grade Separations, or C4, Circulation, Safe Streets, and Primary Response Routes, if participating in person, please complete a speaker card at that fact table and return it to me at the clerk's desk. If you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine at this time. All right, and our first speaker will be Katie Baruzzi. Hi, my name is Katie Baruzzi, and I serve on the Complete Streets Commission, but I'm speaking for myself. Um, I wanted to comment about emergency response routes. Um, I know that when you last met in 2019, there was some discussion about the some of the perceived conflicts and trade-offs between the ways in which we make our streets safer and the need of the fire district to get to emergencies um, within a certain amount of time. Um, and I imagine that's another topic of conversation for tonight. And I wanted to draw your attention to some really excellent publications by NACTO, which is, I'm going to forget what the acronym actually means. Somebody on city staff can help me out. Um, but they've done some really great work on figuring out how to improve or at least maintain city response routes without having to compromise safety on streets. Um, so there's both a video and a really great publication. Uh, but some of the things they talked about were um, uh, using, for example, different kinds of vehicles to respond to different kinds of emergencies. So, for example, if the majority of emergencies are not actually fires that require giant trucks, um, you know, different communities have gotten um, smaller trucks with smaller turning radiuses. Um, they've uh, they've gotten 
um, these fancy golf cart type things called gators in New York so that they can get around the Times Square traffic. Um, Ashland, Oregon has something else they're doing. Um, so that's one idea. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, I, when I've looked at some of the videos of emergency response challenges, I will note that um, the best case scenario when there's congestion is having a wide open space that's neither full of parked cars nor trying to drive cars adjacent to the right hand lane so that drivers can move over. Um, so you can see, for example, in University Avenue in Palo Alto, where you have two through lanes and two wide sort of parking slash bike lanes, um, that it's much easier for drivers to pull over to the right there um, than it is farther down University where you have much narrower spaces um, or basically no bike lanes at all. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing um, improvements even during congestion along Middle Avenue with some of the parking removal um, that's being discussed and the buffered bike lanes that should give cars plenty of space to pull over. And I think we should be looking at other places in the city where we can have a win-win. Um, we'll have um, improved bike facilities um, and also uh, give uh, vehicles a way to pull over during peak congestion periods when emergency response vehicles need to get through. Um, so thank you so much uh, and look forward to our city and fire district working together well to improve safety for everybody. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Santa Lada, followed by Adina Levin. And if you could let us know which agenda item you are commenting on. Hello, everyone. Oh. Hello, everyone. My name is Sandhya Ladha, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director at Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. And I would like to make a public comment on item C4. Uh, before I start, I'd like to second Katie Baruzzi's comments. And the NACTO study she mentions is emergency access in healthy streets. And the word says it all. When it comes to circulation, safe streets, and primary response routes, on one side, we have planners and engineers uh, rethinking our streets to serve bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit to make sure it functions as a public space. And on the other hand, we have emergency responders trying to figure out best ways to travel, uh, to reduce travel time after receiving an emergency call. And for them, often narrower streets and slower streets are often slowing down their operations. But this means that we now have two public interests moving in opposite directions that both value safety and health and both have legitimate aims. And fortunately, with coordination and cooperation, achieving these goals can be met without having or moving without having to move in opposite directions. With careful design of streets and thoughtful purchase of emergency equipment, street designers can coordinate with fire departments to reach mutually beneficial public policy. I'd like to mention a couple stats from the federal level. Uh, the vast majority of emergency calls to the fire department pertain to traffic crashes and medical emergencies and not fires. Nationally, traffic fatalities outnumber fire-related fatalities five is to one, and traffic injuries outnumber fire-related injuries 160, 167 is to one. So a uh, lot of agencies, even statewide, uh, like Caltrans, are beginning to move in the direction of making our streets safer so that the fire responders or emergency responders do not have to address those 167 crashes. And so they're working towards making our streets safer for walking and biking by reducing those number of crashes on our streets. And they're doing so for El Camino Real, all the way from Daly City to San Jose by addressing the first repavement project, which is across Palo Alto to Mountain View. Just to sum things up, as a society, we value quick response when emergencies arise. But at the same time, we also value health, safety from traffic crashes, livable neighborhoods, and places where people of all ages can feel comfortable walking and bicycling. Collectively, we need to reduce the use of motor vehicles to curtail energy consumption and release of GHG emissions. And in order to accomplish these latter goals, we need to design streets built for human scale and activity rather than motor vehicle speed. Each community has different challenges. So collaboration between local fire departments, urban planners, transportation engineers, and public health officials will be invaluable, invaluable to meeting these goals. 
thank you again once uh, thank you for this opportunity to make public comment thank you for your comment so our next speaker will be adina levin followed by sally cole and again if you can let us know which item you are speaking on um, hello uh good evening mayor council members and uh, fire uh and uh Fire Board members and staff, Adina Levin, Menlo Park resident, uh, former Complete Streets Commissioner, uh, speaking for myself and in strong support of the previous comments made by uh, Sandia Lada of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and Katie Baruzzi. Um, uh, there uh, has um, historically been a uh, somewhat of a tension between the uh, uh, fire departments want to have rapid response for emergencies and the uh, uh, need amongst um, community members to have safety in uh, traveling our streets using um, all modes of travel and the um, uh, uh, professional best practices um, in this area have been really changing in recent years. Um, I would also like to uh, support the uh, use of the uh, NACDO guidelines that uh, do have good practices for um, how to maximize the safety for people using the streets while um, supporting response. Um, because so much of the emergency response um, is uh, not for the fires that require the large fire trucks and is for collisions and other medical emergencies that require different kinds of equipment. Um, uh, uh, that is a direction that can help us um, uh, uh, balance the different goals. And um, I would really encourage the staffs of the different agencies to be working together on um, coming up with solutions that can help us improve the um, safety of streets um, simply by relying on uh, you know, wide streets with uh, long straightaways. Um, uh, that's something that encourages drivers to go fast on a regular and day-to-day -day basis. And um, that really increases the likelihood and danger of the collisions. And we wind up swinging toward um, solutions for our streets that makes them less safe and increase the amount that we're needing to have emergency response for emergencies that could have been pre prevented. So please uh, you know, work together on the uh, you know, em emerging good practices to keep our streets safe while supporting emergency response. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Sally Cole, followed by Ezio Alvidi. And again, if you can please state which item you are speaking on. Okay. Hello, I'm Sally Cole, and I'm also on the Complete Streets Commission. I'm the vice chair currently, and I want to introduce myself to any of you on the table that I don't know. Um, but as a citizen of Menlo Park, I also want to thank you because I am immensely proud and grateful to live in a community with such excellent emergency response and fire department. Um, when my mom was uh, still alive and living with me, I'm not joking, the fire department saved her life uh, in 2012 with an emergency call I made and I will forever be grateful for that. Um, tonight I am commenting on C4, uh, Safe Streets. And I think what I'd like to say maybe slightly differently, I, I concur with all the previous comments, but I think I wanted to let you know that I joined the Complete Streets Commission two years ago and I really didn't hadn't done anything like that before and I didn't know what the priorities would be. And it has become really clear to me that safety is our top priority. And people on the commission have been working really hard to improve safety at different intersections, sidewalks, et cetera. And I wanna emphasize that it's, it's not just for bicyclists. We really um, advocate for the safety of all the residents in Menlo Park, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers as well. And so for that reason, it strikes me that um, the fire district and the complete streets commission have a top priority in common and that is safety and i wanted to extend an open hand and um, interest on my part in any way to support um our working together 
perhaps more proactively in a, in a planning mode, perhaps instead of addressing things after they happen, but uh, to address any concerns you have and also to find common ground, recognizing that rapid response is something that is exceedingly important and, and as well, was of great value to me, as I mentioned, um, we'd like to work with you to make sure that um, both sides are, are really protecting the safety of our residents together. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So our next speaker is Ezio Alvidi, and this will be the final call for public comment on our special business items, C1 through C4. Yes, hello, my name is Ezio Alvidi. I wanted to speak to the item on the grade crossings. I believe that's C3. Um, I would be cautious about the engineering studies being done with regard to noise and vibration. My background is in probability and statistics and I've been an engineering consultant. And oftentimes models project average values. Even if the interval of time appears to be short, say five seconds, what you really need to know is the duration of time that the interference uh, was above a threshold and the peak value. This would, would be with respect to disturbing one's sleep during the night and perhaps, and also disturbing one's attention during the day when you're trying to focus on something. And so one, I would be very cautious about that when those studies come in to really press the consultants about just exactly how was their analysis done on that. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Okay, seeing no further hands or cards. Vice Mayor and Board President, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron, and, and thank you for the all the public comments. I just wanted to follow up with the fire district to see if there was any um, public comments or questions that you wanted to um, engage in a part of our discussion. So checking in with you, President. Uh, for any of the items or the first one, C1, community preparedness? Community preparedness. Okay. Any comments from the fire board directors? I'd like to comment on C4, which they, when we get they brought up. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the, well, we're, we're commenting on C. Yeah, uh, we have a mandate, Chief, right, for a seven-minute response countywide. That that's a requirement for us. Is there any Wait, Rob issues? Excuse me, we're only on C one right now. Community well, I, preparedness. I, I said I was going to comment on on C three because that's where all the people commented on, but. Right, so I so, can uh, yeah, I can stop waiting. and we can continue with C one. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Any other comments from C about C one? Because I do want to have a I want to make an acknowledgement really quickly. Uh, so I, I Lynn Bramlett is here in the audience, and I just want to thank her for doing an an incredible job of organizing the residents, not just in the incorporated part of Menlo Park, but also the unincorporated section where I live uh, to just be prepared. And so Lynn, thank you for all the work that you've done. You've given great input to us. And um, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a more spirited discussion, but I think the outcome is always really great. And I think everyone has the same goal of making our community safe or safer. And uh, we just appreciate what you're doing. And, and actually with the others are doing as well, like ADAPT in Atherton and Repact in East Palo Alto. But Lynn, you're here, so I wanted to recognize you. Thanks. Thank you, President Corrali. Um, just any other council members, uh, Mayor Willison, did you wanna provide any um, questions, comments on C1, community preparedness? Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor, and um, echoing President 
Corrales, um, appreciation to Ms. Bramlett and the tremendous, every event I go to, there's more and more um, MPC ready folks. And so I've just been incredibly impressed by her galvanizing um, volunteer community members. And I think, um, uh, I'm not sure if the fire district knows this, but um, the council had our goal setting, priority setting earlier this year and among our top five priorities um, is disaster emergency preparedness. So um, we're taking this topic very seriously. And, um, you know, I think the council's full support is behind collaborating with the fire district. Um, and we look forward to engaging whatever um, level is appropriate um, on this topic. So I just wanna thank you all for the work you do. And um, however we can uh, best partner would be, would be great. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Councilmember Nash or Councilmember Doerr, did you have anything you want to provide on C1? I just want to be the third to quickly, shortly echo appreciation for Lynn Ramlin and all the work you do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Doerr, and, and thank you, Ms. Bramlin. Uh, President Corrales? Yeah, sure. So there are a couple of our fire board uh, members who would like to make a comment, and I think both of them are from the EPREP committee. So let me recognize um, the chair of the EPREP committee, Gary Bloom, first, and then um, Director Bernstein can go after Gary or Director Bloom. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm thrilled to, to know that it's such a high priority for the city and the city council. And I think we all had a pretty good wake up call this last winter as to why this needs to be a top priority. Um, yeah, I'd echo the same thing with, with Lynn's efforts to, to coordinate the community. But we also should recognize that we kind of have a unique model here in that the city, you know, there's a city structure and there's a fire district structure. And my real question for the council and, and maybe perhaps for the city manager of Menlo Park is, is what can we do to support the effort of the city? And I think we need to, over time, recognize the clear boundaries as to who, own, who is owning which part of it. And to some extent, I see the fire district as a service structure to help service what the city needs to deliver the kinds of community preparedness that you think is important as a council. And ultimately, while well, we've had a lot of input about what the overall structures need to be, I think one of the things jointly we're going to need to, need to focus on is how do we work together and what part of the, yeah, the, the needed ingredients to make a good program come from essentially the fire district and which ingredients come from the city. Because, uh, you know, unlike a lot of areas where the city, you know, the city fire department is part of the city controlled by the city council, we don't have that model here. And so I think additional communication is going to be really important. And I think one of the things that as we're rebuilding the team that we're starting to discuss is what does that service model look like? And I'd be interested in any input that you may have on that. And it doesn't have to be tonight, but just as we align to make sure we understand the service structure between the two organizations, I think is going to be critically important. I have a follow-up question, Vice President Bloom. Um, and that is, if, if we are not providing that information to you this evening, how shall we get it to you? Um, yeah, I, I think that information can come in through either the Emergency Preparedness Committee, but I think the most effective um, conduit for it is between your police chief and your city manager into our fire chief and, and Chief Johnson as well on prevention who owns the organization. Um, you know, we've, with the city of Atherton, we've done a couple meetings where we've had some community representation, but we've also had the, fire, the police chief there um, and city council members where we've just had discussion about what the model looks like. And we're starting to get some valuable input from those kinds of discussions as well. Um, but ultimately, I, I don't think it's a, yeah, I don't think it's a one-way discussion, a one-way, you know, here's our requirements. It's not a requirements document as much as it is a collaborative effort. Uh, but our, our primary contact would be, yeah, Chief Lorenzen and Chief Johnson. Thank you. 
Hi, I have another follow-up question to that. Thank you so much, Vice President Boom. Um, I'm curious if there are ever meetings between the district and all the, the communities that are served, because I wonder also if there might be interesting things to hear from East Palo Alto, from Atherton about our shared needs or, or different needs. Thanks. So let me let me answer that for you, um, Council Member Dorr. So we generally have annual meetings with the, the other councils and also, um, well, the other stakeholders. So the town of Atherton will have a joint meeting with and also the city of East Palo Alto. So those are being scheduled right now. And of course, especially after the storms, the community preparedness piece is high on our list as it is, I think, for most of the other cities as well. So does that, I don't know if that answers your question, but but there is that. And we've I've actually thought about how we can do something for all of the district, right? And that's something that we haven't had a chance to really, you know, kind of drill down to at this time because we're trying to get the individual joint meetings done. This is the first one I think of the year, but I'm hoping before the end of the year, we can do something. And, and maybe that's something that we put on our agenda to discuss. And maybe even the e-prep committee might want to look at that as well, more of a global picture for the entire district, because we're all working together. And, and I mean, quite frankly, disasters really don't know any boundaries, right? So, so that that's that's something that we've thought about in the future, but I'm glad that you're making that request. Yes, thank you. And that's exactly it, of, of thinking about a space to bring the whole district together it would be really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that too, that I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm new to the board here, so, but I'm not, I'm not new to disaster prep or to emergency response um, throughout the county, but I also don't necessarily believe one size is going to fit all for what the different requirements are between the different communities that we serve. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think the discussions I'm recommending take place is necessary is to make sure that as we build out our model of what services we're going to provide as a district, that we understand what the requirements are in, in some cases, unique requirements of different cities. And yeah, we can clearly see in the in the last round of the wind emergencies that you know some of the power issues over in East Palo Alto had different consequences than the power issues that occurred in either Atherton or Menlo Park. Um, and, and what those residents needed was slightly different as well. So I think we have to, we have to recognize that there's a lot of common ground between the, the various areas that we serve, but we also have to rec recognize that there's likely some differences that need to be accommodated. And, and so I, I personally don't think that the one size fits all is going to work versus a, a strategy that says we have a, a common set of goals to meet the needs of each individual community. And then when we have the regional disaster that we all know how to come together. So I, I just wanted to recognize that Director Bernstein did have a, a question or a comment. I was just gonna recognize him because I think you have, a, he had his hand raised. So thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, yes. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I'm a Menlo Park resident and actually live in the Willows. Um, uh, Gary Bloom mentioned the wake-up call of New Year's. Um, we've had lots of wake-up calls. And after the wake-up call, everybody goes back to sleep. And I'm really interested in knowing what's going to change and how it's going to change. Uh, just and, and my question really, it's less as a fire board member than it is as a Menlo Park resident. Um, we had some serious issues here. I mean, there was debris buildup in the culverts. What are we going to do next year? I know there were no sandbags in the willows. You know, what are we going to do next year? There were on the last day of the emergency and all this, they opened up a shelter, but it was too late that day, I think, to open up. What are we going to do next year? And it seems to me that's what we ought to there really ought to be some sort of after action analysis of what's going to change. But all the talk about, you know, putting documents on the shelf and, and, and team building and all that kind of stuff, it all sounds wonderful, but it doesn't result in anything. 
And I've lived through it. In fact, they abandoned my street. I was sleeping up on the second floor. My street got abandoned. It was at 89 when we had the last flood. I didn't even know until the next day when I went out to go to work and there were big, huge logs down my street that they had evacuated. Um, how do we get evacuation notices to people? How do we let them know what's happening? Um, anyway, I, I'm not saying that in an angry way. I'm sort of saying that in a way that says, somehow we have to agendize and we can talk about all the politics and the thank youing and we appreciate your efforts and all this kind of stuff, but that hasn't changed one thing as far as I know. Now, maybe I don't know what's happened, but I haven't heard anything yet from either the fire district or the city council about what's gonna happen differently um, next year. So that's sort of my challenge in doing this is what are we gonna do differently? And uh, I think there are things and many of you know what to do, uh, but who's taking the responsibility and, and, and how do we do that? Um, so I'm looking forward to having, and we can perhaps do it through our emergency preparedness committee. Maybe we can do it for a follow-up or a community meeting or something, but I'm more talking about not the things that community volunteers like Lynn's group does, and I'm part of that MPC ready myself. I'm talking about what the professionals are gonna do. Um, how do we get messages out? How do we get our power fixed quicker? And, and those kinds of things. So thank you. Virginia, I'd like to add. Sure, please, Director Sloan. Thank you. Uh, I think it kind of falls into, we have three major volunteer groups uh, with the three different communities, uh, kind of the parallel with the county also. But the three, I feel there are three major responsibilities that the fire district should do is to support these volunteer groups by training, uh, identify the, the credentials that each one of these people that go, let's say through Lynn's uh, Meadow Park Ready classes, I've been to a few of them. I mean, who's attending those? What are their credentials? Uh, in case of a disaster, uh, the record keeping that's kept, uh, what equipment can the fire district chief uh, provide to the to three major volunteer groups? And lastly, the funding out of the fire district. What funding can we provide through uh, the fire district for uh, materials that Meadow Park Ready needs? and the other two volunteer groups. So I think we need to be more of a supportive role as a fire district, since the major responsibility in an emergency situation falls with the city and town and the county, and special districts are more of a support function. So thank you. Director Jones. Thank you. Um, and just listening, and I'll follow up something that Gary, um, started to talk about, he talked about it, but I want to kind of maybe add a little bit more. Uh, and I think someone asked, what can we do? I, I think it's a, it's a three prong um, uh, answer. And in each start, and the, the question and answer begins with uh, the city, in terms of what does the city want out of emergency preparedness? Um, the other prong of the story is, is the community. What does the community want and need uh, to do what it needs to do to be an effective force within the community when there is a disaster? Uh, and the third part of it is, is the fire district. Uh, what can the fire district do to support uh, not only the city, but also as well as the, the, the community groups that are operating within, within the district. And that form has to take place, I think, within each, uh, each uh, area within the city. The city has to start putting that, agendizing those items and talking about it. And then the city, I think, uh, needs to uh, bring together both the community and a representative from the from the city to talk about those questions, talk about those areas of mutual benefits uh, that each has to, to bring to the table. 
And then there's a third part of that communication is all three entities, both the city, uh, the fire district, and the community really need to come together and kind of see how, one, the district is supporting those, those two entities and how the cities are supporting uh, the fire district. Because it all re relates back to, I'm going to throw this out there, Rob, they're going to get to it, uh, C4. In terms of looking, if there's an emergency come up, uh, the fire district, fire trucks has to get out there. If the streets are not conducive enough for it to meet that seven minute requirement that the district is trying to get to, then we got a problem. So those type of issues need to be mitigated before the disaster happens. Uh, and they all intertwine together. But I think the, the form in by which the conversation takes place, I think needs to, there, there may be a, maybe a form already within the city where that's happening. But if it's not, then it, somewhere along the line, a, a form like that needs to take place. And it needs to be more than just when a disaster happened. I think it, in the, at this stage of the game, there needs to be an ongoing conversation, whether it's monthly, by month, uh, twice every other month, a conversation needs to take place in an organized way. So that when we meet again, we can start sharing notes. We can start sharing what, uh, as a district, what we really can do to help support you and also vice versa. Because if something, someone mentioned about a regional, the city's getting together, what is the city gonna get together on? You know, if there's a disaster, how do we get together? Do we talk the same language? And that's a, that's a bigger education. That's a bigger commitment that needs to take place from, from not only the city of Menlo Park, but the other cities as well. So I'll just... Thanks, Robert. Council Member Nash? You have a question for us, please. No, I actually had some comments and that's um, the first thing I wanted to, to point out. Well, first of all, I agree with everything that's been said and I think it's so exciting to be having this discussion today. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out is that Menlo Park is very diverse and we have um, many different needs that vary from people at the Bayfront who to um, wildfire, you know, with seas and um, sea level rise and flooding and um, up to Sharon Heights where we have are concerned about emergency response to um, wildfires and the creeks and there's many different um, parts to the city. So I think that we do have different pieces that would be interesting to see um, regionally how we can all collaborate. Although each city definitely does have their own unique uh, group of um, needs. Um, but um, the, one of the first things that we have done is to identify emergency response as, and emergency preparedness as a city council priority. And I think that that's a really important part of doing that is to identify that to staff and staff is now working as budget is, as the budget is being prepared to respond to that priority. And so their staff is taking that into account and it will be coming forward. Um, we will be having um, personnel discussions and how do we need to resource that since it is a priority. So that's not something that has been forgotten as part of that. There is, of course, the communications and how do we better communicate to, um, to residents and with other agencies. Um, there's certainly, um, we were lucky this time to have this experience with the storms where we didn't lose water. And I think in an earthquake, you know, if we were to lose water, that's obviously very just front and center, both from the firefighting to the drinking water, to being able to flush the toilets, um, all these different needs. Um, so we are certainly looking at this very globally. We are looking ahead. Um, I believe that we are doing a after action report as um, currently, um, city manager Murphy may wanna provide more information on that, but there is there are efforts going on. It is not something where we have just said, oh, we made it through and wait for the next one. There are proactive efforts going on in the city. Um, I personally attended the Haywired um, day long event um, training exercise. Thank you. And there were, um, gosh, I think, 10 staff members there. It's something that is a priority. People are getting trained 
and um, across all our departments. I think every department had um, at least one person there and um, Chief Norris had, was there with several people. Um, so again, it's a, um, something that's going on. And I think that all of this can't happen soon enough because we don't know when the next um, event will arise and we will need to be, um, we will wish we had all this in place. But I think that um, this is a really good step toward it. Every time we get together and talk, it's really important. And um, City Manager Murphy has been very focused on this along with everything else that he does um, moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, no, so so I just wanted to get back to the comment from Council Member Dorr about this district-wide type of meeting it, and, and also kind of address my thoughts to the fire board. There are for sure unique needs for the different cities and even areas, sections of the neighborhoods within the cities. But I do think that there are commonalities throughout the district for all the cities and the unincorporated area, which I, I live in, um, that we can focus on in this type of meeting. It's just the pandemic hit too. So that didn't, that kind of put an, an abrupt stop to even doing something like this. So I just, I mean, we'll bring it up. Let me bring it up to the fire board, but um, if we can find the commonalities, at least that's a good starting point, right? And then we can look at the unique needs of the cities and the neighborhoods. Because I agree with you, Council Member Nash, that Menlo Park definitely has a lot of diversity, right? Um, for better or worse, right? And, and the needs are very different. So it, that's why I think what Lynn is doing is so important within NBC Ready. And, and I think Chuck, Director Bernstein brings up a lot of good points in the, the things that he saw in his neighborhood and probably the need for more preparedness and more coordination. So let, let me think about how we can, the, the fire board to think about how we can collectively do this in a, on a larger scale to understand the um, the unique needs for the, the, the district has to look at, but understand that the cities will have to also work with us to address their own unique needs. Any other comments on C1? Uh, excuse me. Mayor Wilson's hand oh. raised. Mayor Wilson. Thank you. Um, thank you for this conversation. Um, in listening to the discussion, I'm thinking about emergency preparedness. Um, how do we prepare for the emergency ahead of time? How do we prepare our residents? How we prepare our neighborhoods and how we prepare our um, municipal facilities? Um, and then once we've prepared, kind of done our pre emergency work, um, kind of what are we planning to do during the emergency? And so I think there's lots of layers and then within those structures, who's who has the expertise and um, who's leading on those. So some of those, um, so if we're looking at municipal facilities during an emergency and how we prepare those, if they're municipal facilities that we're gonna be using as cooling centers, smoke centers, uh, power outage centers or um, heat centers, um, and I think that was a big wake up call for us to have protocols in place for when those get triggered to be open. That's obviously a city thing. But if we're looking at, at equipping each resident with um, a toolkit, um, a knowledge of who their next door neighbors are, um, and of making sure they have enough water, um, that might be more of an MPC ready, um, you know, trained by the fire district job. So I think if we break it down into, you know, who's getting prepared, um, and then who has the expertise on, on what type of preparing for. And then I think one of the big learnings that we also had um, from this go around was communication. Um, and we were really reliant on PG&E for some communication that was unfortunately extremely unreliable. And so um, I think that was a big learning for us and also realizing that um, residents were hungry for information and really, um, on the one hand, deprived of information, on the other hand, overwhelmed with information. So coordinating our communication channels um, so that there can be kind of a coordinated um, uh, message to constituents or common constituents so that they feel they have the most up-to-date relevant information. Um, and then I know that our city staff worked very hard during these storms, um, you know, through the nights 
um, to clear debris and to get more sandbags. And um, I don't think it's like a, a pat on the back situation. I think it was um, really um, huge work that they did. And I think they also did a lot of triaging that wasn't um, really apparent potentially to the um, to the naked eye of where is the area with you know the greatest um, need and, and um, deploying resources there. So um, perhaps making those decisions more transparent. Um, again, going back to communication, um, but I think that there's a lot of good work to do. Um, as Councilmember Nash and I both said, this is a council priority, and we feel confident that our city staff um, is is um, approaching it as such. So, um, thanks for this conversation. Thank you, Mayor Willison. And I wanted to give our city manager an opportunity um, if there was anything you wanted to provide. I, I appreciate all the director's feedback and, and I agree, and uh, the, especially the what and the how, um, Director Bernstein, um, I appreciate everything that you said. Justin. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. So just uh, appreciate the opportunity for uh, being here this evening and being present as part of this, this meeting. As uh, Vice President Bloom said earlier, a lot of the you know communication will be between myself and the fire chief, the, the police chief, the fire marshal, from kind of a staff to sp staff perspective. And so that's where um, I'll be uh, devoting, uh, continue to devote a lot of energy there. I have been um, also uh, focusing on uh, the some of the activities with the MPC Ready. So spending um, some time with Ms. Ms. Bramlett, some meetings. So I, I do. Uh, Contribute quite a bit of uh, time there and our, our team, uh, in addition, our assistant city manager who's remote tonight has been heavily involved with that. Um, in terms of um, to the kind of uh, some of the topics about the, the, the community, uh, yes, there was, um, we will, uh, you know, as uh, council member Nash said, we are indeed preparing an after action report of the um, storms from the, from this um, uh, past season and we'll use that for uh, lessons learned and uh, helping to prepare for for next year so all of those are uh, works in progress uh, looking forward to working uh, across the community on those issues um, for the future thank you city manager Murphy and and just as a a, a little bit of a, a follow-up is is that all of the emergencies that is that we've experienced in Menlo Park, each one of us have, has experienced it in the moment. Um, what I had a difficulty with was with the power issue um, is that it was hard to respond to an area that has high population and low resources. And for me, that's where the priority, priority um, needs to be um, when we look at what to do um, the next time around, especially around communication. A lot of folks did not have internet service and so couldn't get certain information, the SMC alerts, we already know, I think less than 10% um, of residents are actually signed up to get information. Um, and then once they get the information, what do they do with it? Um, so I know at some point we did have a subcommittee between the fire district and the city council. I don't know what happened to it. And so since it is a priority for the city council, I think that definitely has to be restarted. And then I think join the committee that the fire district already has, as opposed to creating something new um, with Vice President Bloom and Director Bernstein. Um, so if that would be up to the council to decide if that's um, possible, um, I would be willing to participate even if it is not a council subcommittee because of how important it is um, so that we can actually follow up. And I think that the the report that the city manager is putting together as far as what the uh, the aftermath of all of the storms, I think is a great item to have on that agenda as well. And um, yeah, please, Director Solano. Yeah, um, Madam Vice Mayor, if the fire district would, let's say, financially provide the city of Meadow Park with a financial amount, where would the fire district send that? Would, would, would it be to the city manager's office under the, would it be under your office? Would it be forwarded to the police department? How would that structure work if we wanted to provide funding? Because if you remember the three major areas that I was concerned about was, was training, equipment, and the financial resources that we could provide as a fire district. So that would be like the first step that I would 
want to kind of start <laughs> if we could. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, in response to um, <clears throat> Board Member Solano. I, I think the most important thing would be the city. It's the it, it would be the city. We can work through the the specifics and uh, reporting and accountability. This is the first time in my tenure with the with the city that there's been an offer, potential offer from the from the fire district to the, to the city of Menlo Park in, in this regard. So, assuming that that's something that conceptually would work itself out, we we can definitely work through the details of. How, how to go about that, but that's it's uh, I'm a little uh, I'm great grateful for the offer, assuming it's in this is probably not the uh, venue for it, but I think work through some of those before we get to that level of detail. Yeah. So thank you, Justin. Um, so let me let me just say this: it has not been discussed by the board. We are in the middle, not by the board as an agendized item, but we have we are in the we are in the middle of. Um, literally reorganizing that Department of Emergency Management, which the chief is doing. Um, I think that the situation that we had before where we were, if you look at our involvement, it's at the community level and at the municipal level, right? And so I don't know, probably need to have this on the agenda, um, what is happening in moving forward with our partnership with the city from a municipality member, uh, um, a level where we were working with your emergency on the emergency response plans and all of that. Um, but the at the community level, you know, we have to even discuss that. So I think it's a little premature to even talk about this. But if Director Solano is thinking that, you know, how would the how what would the process be for anything that would happen in that way if, if there are funds that would be um, given to any of the cities, you know, how that that process would take shape. That's something that we can discuss, but I think that we have to figure that out as a board first and at the two different levels, I think as Mayor Wollison said. So let me let me just address something that um, Mayor Wollison said, because during this time, I actually contacted the various mayors of the, the cities to let them know um, what we were trying to, you know, just to make sure that we were, they knew that we were there to support y'all, right? Generally, I was, because it was like, well, and I knew that Bell Haven was getting hit pretty badly and East Palo Alto was getting hit pretty badly. And you know, I was in communication with the chief about making sure that like, for example, station two, and I think I talked to director Jones about this was kind of available as a warming center. And then we learned that the fire district had provided generators for um, the East Palo Alto city hall. And I just wanted to make sure that Mayor Wilson knew at the time that we were there to support um, Menlo Park as well. And she had mentioned to me about the Bell Haven area and where I think the senior center there was available for, for people who needed to, who needed a, a, a safe place to be. And so at least we were trying to communicate at that retail level. And I think that communication coordination can be a lot better. And maybe that's where the liaisons can, can play a role because after I on the mayors. I told Director Bernstein, who's the Menlo Park liaison about that, and gave um, him your contact information, Mayor Wilson. I think I'd mentioned to Director Jones that I'd contacted um, Mayor Gaucher in East Palo Alto. So, I mean, you know, when we're dealing with an emergency in real time or disaster, it's just the protocols. I mean, you just you do what you can. And so I agree that communications has to be really, really open and um, better equipped. I mean, cause it was hard. I mean, SMC alert, as you said, Vice Mayor Taylor was, you know, maybe 10% of the constituents or the public have signed up, but even that 10% wasn't getting the SMC alert. So that was problematic as well. Director Solano. Uh, utmost is the financial resources that we have the fire district to help the cities and towns and the county that we service with our services. And probably one of the highest priorities would be the financial resources that we have in order to provide to the city of Medlow Park, Atherton East Palo Alto, and parts of the county unincorporated area. So uh, I don't know what the red tape is, but you know, let's provide whatever funding that can go forward with the three, at least start with the three major volunteer groups that we have, Menlo Park Ready, 
uh, uh, what is it, EPAC in East Palo Alto, and of course, uh, uh, ADAP in uh, Atherton. So, you know, let's get the ball rolling here. So uh, the training's already happening. Uh, we are equipping the volunteers through the fire district and training them through the fire district. And also uh, the individual volunteer groups are providing training for them through their own organizations too. So, uh, I don't know, I, I just feel that we need to help these volunteer groups and by help, helping the volunteer groups will help our communities in order to participate in all these different programs for a natural disaster. So I'll be quiet now. Uh, Vice President Bloom. Yeah, thank you. So, so I just wanna kind of, I think this is a really healthy discussion. You know, it's obviously a really important topic, but I, you know, I also kind of step back from a little bit and say, what really transpired during the, you know, kind of emergencies and the disasters that we had locally here was we didn't have a real good plan up front. So I think everybody in every agency and every city and every city, you know, maintenance department, police department, I think everybody did a tremendous amount of work. Most of the community doesn't have a lot of visibility into a lot of the things that were done, whether it was the fire district, the city maintenance crews, the fire, the police departments. Um, yeah, you know, we talk about things like communication. I'm an Atherton resident. You know, I have all the modern communication techniques in the world, um, but I can tell you that we went through a 36, almost 48 hour period where we didn't even get text messages. Our, folks, our cellular network was not working in our neighborhood. So not only did we not have power or internet, we didn't have cell structures either. And so, you know, and this goes back to my earlier comment that this was all a wake up call. We saw things that in, the, in our daily life that were interrupted that we depend on. And in, a, in an interesting way, we built a lot of our emergency communications around an infrastructure that I think we woke up one morning and said, wow, that's not very stable. Um, yeah, I was, I was personally, I'm a technologist by trade. I was personally shocked that cellular coverage went down, makes perfect sense. Power was down for an extended period of time. The generators powering cell stations started running out of fuel and there was no structure in place to refuel those generators. So we lost, yeah, the power had a cascading effect in many different areas. Um, but with, with all that said, I think it's a healthy discussion, but I, I think the best step forward is for our respective staffs to get together and start formulating a really solid plan that has a lot of elements that incorporates funding, incorporates the community, you know, community response teams, incorporates what's each of the police departments could do, what's each of the cities going to do, what are the maintenance departments going to do, and how do all these groups work together so that when we actually have the disaster, we have a playbook to go by. And, you know, I've, I've, you know, Chief Lorenzen's obviously been much more involved in some of these things than I have, but I have been involved in some of the major, you know, fire response efforts, um, in particular, the campfire up in, in San Benito County. And, you know, ultimately what, what we saw happen up there was once Cal Fire got engaged, you had this really thorough execution plan that just rolled out and things just start happening. The trucks, the resources, the people, the bodies, the communication, everything starts arriving. Yeah, you know, the first 24 to 36 hours was total chaos. And then Cal Fire parachutes in with this well thought out strategy and plan and everything changed. Yeah, you know, all of a sudden the first responders that were responding up there actually had a way to get fed. They had a place to sleep, you know, all, all those kinds of things. And I think we should look at that a little bit as a model and just say, let's, let's make sure we have a clear strategy and a clear plan of what we're going to do before we start just throwing resources, people, money, efforts at it. Because I personally believe that it's the lack of a strategy and a lack of a plan that came into play you know, more so in the most recent disasters than anything else. And like I said, some of our natural assumptions of what would be there got, you know, got kind of pushed aside because they, you know, things broke that we didn't think could break. And we, you know, nobody thought power would be out as long as it would be. 
So it was a cascading effect, but we just need to build a plan that encompasses how together are, you know, as the cities, the fire departments, the community, how we're gonna respond. But I'd focus on strategy and plan first. Director Jones. Oh, sorry, sorry, Council Member Door. Just to quickly respond to that, uh, I really appreciate that Vice President Bloom, um, and I, I appreciate all the fantastic work these volunteer organizations do, and also I appreciate the turn back to what are we doing as, as uh, government bodies to address these needs and build a cohesive strategy and work together, because um, I think that's really the crux of uh, what we are in charge of around this table and so excited to focus attention there, and that makes me wonder if um, I know the action, after action report is something that we're working on right now within the city. If once that is ready, there could be a special meeting between the city and the fire district to, to talk through that in more, greater detail to go over the different learnings and what that means for next time. And maybe that could be a useful resource then to say, okay, in, inside the fire district, what does this mean uh, that team can do in preparation for next time and same for the city? I, I think that's a great idea with the meeting for that very purpose and focused on the after action, after action item report. Director Jones. Oh. Excuse me, Fujin. Can't we move it to our emergency prep committee mm -hmm. to work with the re representative from City well, of Menlo Park? Yeah, I, I'm not sure they have a designated liaison. For the funding aspect. Well, we're, we're, I think that the board has to talk about the funding aspect first, which we have not had a chance to actually discuss and agendize. So why don't we, I want to hear from Director Jones before we even talk about a future agenda item. In closing, I, I strongly uh, have a sense that understanding the process for getting prepared. Uh, that means looking at our, at our infrastructure. Uh, what do we need to really do to try to mitigate certain sea rise, issues with sea rise, with the creek rise? We need to understand and, and put in motion a plan in order to, to, try to try to head that off in some way. And, and I think there are entities out there right now that are working on you know, trying to put together, trying to trying to make that work. And I think the city has a, has a strong role as well as the fire district have a strong role in work with those uh, organizations that are uh, working in that area. I don't know what they are, what it might be, but I think that's part of the conversation that we need to have with them. The other part of it has to do with, uh, we talked about today, community preparedness in terms of what do we do how, how do the community organizations get supported by both the city and the fire district to be better at uh, preparing our community, developing that plan uh, and working that, that, that particular plan. And lastly, in any disaster, because I've experienced it in East Palo Alto uh, and other places, that a recovery is gonna, eventually is gonna happen. There will be darkness before the dawn. Recovery will happen. Who's going to be at the table to assist with that? There are community organizations that are out there that, that provide certain services already. Uh, the question is, have we tapped into them in some organized way of figuring out how do we go about delivering, getting food to people who need food? How do we know about homing in on the seniors and making sure that they are okay? There are organizations that work with these institutions. So how do we, how do we tap into that? How do we develop a plan with them in order to, to put a recovery aspect of it to, to take place? As well as doing the emergency preparedness, these individuals may be in need because the disaster is not gonna just happen this day and it's all over the next day. There may be a period of time uh, where that's it's an ongoing kind of need. How do we fulfill that? And I think that's where the conversation uh, within the city as well as the community preparedness group, as well as the district. And from that, I think we will see exactly what resources will be necessary in order to sustain that, either from the beginning, uh, from the, the trying to figure out what the mitigation aspect of it, as well as at the end in terms of recovery. So I'm gonna leave that. Okay. Thank you, Director Jones. I think we've exhausted C1. 
Thank you, President Corrali. Uh, the next um, item on the agenda is C2, Fire Station 1 at 300 Middlefield Road. Chief, do you want to kick off that conversation? Because sure. I think there are a few issues with regard to that station, including um, water needs by the city and also our training tower, for example. Sure. Uh, everyone's familiar, I would imagine, with our fire station one, our headquarters station on Middlefield. It is our oldest uh, facility built in 1955. So it is first well, top near the top of the, the list, we still haven't figured out internally with our facilities committee, which which it is, but pretty close, if not at the top of our list for replacement. So um, a couple of issues there, uh, we're looking at you know, a complete teardown of that fire station. We, um, I don't know how many years ago it was, within the last 10 years, acquired an acre of property from the seminary next door. So on, on two sides of our existing parcel, and um, as a, most people are probably aware, during the last elections, there was you know, certainly some issues that came up related to the zoning. It's currently zoned, I think, residential non-conforming, so it, it would need some kind of rezoning um, in order for us to move forward on the construction too. So we have an interest in expanding the station. We don't know quite the scope and scale that it's going to be yet. We have a facilities ad hoc committee that we're going to partner up with. Director Bloom and Jones are on that. We're going to work with an architect and try and scope out what we can afford, what we need on that site. Everybody has their visions and plans. We'll have to figure out what the, the price tag is and, and figure that out. And also what the city's needs and desires are also for what that looks like, what our space and use issues are, what issues we have with the neighbors. Uh, I know the city's got some interest in ultimately long-term emergency water supplies. Uh, there, there is a test well that's going to be drilled, I think in July or August, you know, for this um, back, far back end to see if there's even reliable water underneath that parcel. So many discussions to be had with the city. And uh, figured this would be a good place just to talk about our, our mutual needs and benefits. Obviously, uh, yeah, that station's in, in strong need of, of, of repair, and we want to put in some training facilities in the back, being cognizant of the neighbors also. So um, that's kind of where we sit right now. I'll, I'll just add um, that, that the chief mentioned that an ad hoc committee was created for the facilities issues because it will... Let me just say this, we were very lucky that over the last nine years, we've been able to build three new stations, including station six in downtown. So we're very proud of that. And our last station, um, station four, up on Alameda de los Polcas and Valparaiso is hopefully gonna be done by September, October. So um, look forward to having y'all join us in that grand opening and ribbon cutting. But the as the chief said, the um, directors who will, will be involved with the facilities ad hoc will be Director Jones and Director Bloom. So I don't think they've had a meeting yet to even discuss this. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing about what comes out of that um, meeting when it happens, especially with Director Jones's background in development and and, and real estate and that kind of thing. So um, just, I'm not done, please, Rob. Oh, I'll just, can, can I, I go next? Yes. Thank you. So um, I just wanted y'all to know that there is um, an ad hoc committee because we take this very seriously. And as we look into the future and how we wanna, where we wanna spend our money, how we're gonna spend our money to deal with the facilities. Director Solano. Thank you. Uh, could we get some type of, a, uh, I, I can't say commitment, but kind of an agreement uh, to try to get the, zoning approved for us to build fire station one with the current council members here and see how they feel uh, about uh, changing the zoning so we don't have any issues with that well it's not on the agenda item if i think if i'm hearing you correctly vice mayor taylor um, but i do think that there are other terms that have to be discussed that might be best discussed between the city manager and the fire chief uh, I know that the water 
the water well and the storage area, the storage issue has been important. It's actually been an issue for many, many years, even before Justin became the city manager. So, and before Chief Lorenzen's time. So I do think that that conversation regarding that should should start and, and how that might fit in with zoning is something that they can discuss and then maybe bring it back. And I do think that um, council member Doors suggestion of having another meeting for, um, oh my gosh, I just lost my thought, for the act, act after action report, you might be able to put this on there as well because it would probably be part of that with regard to water storage. So I, I don't know, maybe this is a staff issue at this time, um, but I'm you know happy to entertain other suggestions, Vice Mayor Taylor. Thank you, um, President Corrali. And actually we'll put this on to our city manager. Um, what do you think as far as the, the discussion around rezoning the water issues for station um, station one? Uh, let's see, so um, for a, a, a future meeting to kind of frame what the, what the spectrum of is, issues are to be able to redevelop that station and incorporate um, emergency water as part of that? Is that the... I think so, but I think the conversation has to start with you and the chief first. Yes. That, that's my main concern. Okay. Yes. Because y'all know what, what we need the most, the best. Great. Right. Yes. Director Jones. I, I think the initial conversation needs to take place between the city manager and the chief, but I think through the work that the committee, our committee is going to do in terms of really looking at uh, errors in, in state and in, in putting together a process for uh, completing, completing the process. Um, I think, and on the city side, I'm not sure if that process began and end with the city <laughs> uh, city manager or if there's an ad hoc committee within the city uh, or, or a housing committee or some other committee that may look at the, the plans and the process as well. Uh, I think that information that we generate what our needs are and being able to communicate to with someone which is uh, hopefully a counterpart at the city, I think we can kind of uh, move the project along and, and identify the errors that are concerned and try to mitigate them somehow. Yes, yeah, so the, the chief isn't gonna be working in a vacuum. He's gonna be taking direction from the board and this ad hoc committee, I'm sure um, with, with, well, especially with Director Jones's expertise, we'll be able to you know, throw out issues and ideas as well. Director Bloom. Yeah, just just want to come. I mean, this is not a train that's left the station already. Um, we're we're not even at the stage of you know kind of conceptual thoughts about what it looks like. We're in the early phases of even talking about the requirements for you know what does that facility need to do and what are the options you know given the the land size we have and everything else. So I think there'll be plenty of opportunity for the chief to socialize kind of our thoughts as those develop. And I think this is a, you know, it's a good item for the agenda for you to know that it's it's on our radar and it's something that we want to address. I think it's a, it will be a benefit to the community to have a modern facility there. Um, it, you know, at some stage, it just gets to be more and more difficult over time for a large fire operation to work out of a aged somewhat decrepit <laughs> facility. Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to tour it. I hadn't been in it for about 10 years. And yeah, I could even see the degradation of the facility over the course of the last 10 years. It just reaches a point of, you know, a point of no return where it's, it's not a facility that's necessarily aligned to be remodeled or anything else. It's a facility that needs to be rebuilt. And I think there's a huge benefit to the community of having a, a modern facility there. But yeah, this is really a, an agenda item to, to, you know, put it on your radar let you know that we're going to be circling back around to socialize what some of our thoughts are, and then we'll have to together decide what's what's best and you know, what can be done within the various restrictions the fire district has and the city has both um, to serve our communities. Thank you. Are there any other questions, uh, Mayor Willison? Um, well, thank you for um bringing this uh, concept to us. And um, I think in principle, very supportive of you being able to modernize um, your main fire station. 
Um, I live right behind it. And I think a lot of us are proud um, to have that fire station there and, and want to see it continue for many, many years um, successfully. Um, some questions that I'm curious about um, as it's a training facility, um, as you move forward with your plans and kind of communicating to the neighbors and to uh, the larger community, is um, is the training um, uses that you're planning on having there um, commiserate with the current um, operations, or are you looking to increase um, the scope and scale of the training there? Um, I know that um, the fire district's very proud to host a lot of other districts um, with you know really cutting edge training. Um, so I think that's a question um, as you work that through um, that people are gonna be curious about in the neighborhood. Um, and, um, but overall, and, and we appreciate your willingness to let us uh, drill for water if we can find it. Um, we wanna make sure as we talk about emergency preparedness that we're prepared for different types of inevitabilities and making sure we have enough reserve water is critical for our mutual constituents. Um, so I, I would encourage you to um, just engage um, the community as you continue to develop your plans. And um, we look forward to seeing what you come up with. Thanks. Chief, would you like to respond to the mayor? Uh, sure. I mean, we are incredibly cognizant of the fact that it's in a residential neighborhood and that we need to blend with the community. And I've already met with some of the neighbors there to discuss about our plans. So I'm, I'm not sure what the scope and scale will be. Uh, I know there won't be any you know, thick black smoke coming up from behind there. We're, we're aware. We fortunately still have a relationship um, with PG&E and we can do that off the Dumbarton Bridge. And even if that uh, changes, we won't be moving that to that area there. But um, yes, we will work with the community and with the city council and our board on working on a design that, that blends nicely into that neighborhood and is um, understanding of, of the fact that some of it's residential. Oh, let me, so Mayor Willison, there is training that's done more localized, more locally. So with the firefighters themselves there. So this is not gonna be the, the task force training that we envision. Yeah, that's absolutely. Good. Yeah. And and we welcome, you know, I know there are sometimes larger training events there. And and um for the most part, I think they're very welcomed by the larger community. Um just wanted to know as you expand if it's and I think the chief um, answered that I have been out to the PG and E substation and seen some of that larger kind of rubble um, <laughs> training things. Um, and it's good to know that that's not coming um, to this site, um, but uh, I think it's fabulous that you're looking to upgrade your facility. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on C2? Director Solano? Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, that's an excellent point. You don't want a 500 foot tower there or anything. Uh, I'm more of an advocate uh, being from a law enforcement background of the consolidation of training which is more cost effective. Uh, presently, there are six training towers in San Mateo County. Uh, I know the chief and his staff are in the planning process as to what type of renovations we're gonna do there or what we're gonna actually build there. Uh, we're definitely gonna build a fire station, right, Chief? Uh, as to the breadth of the training itself, uh, I'm not an advocate of, of a sole training facility for Menlo Park Fire. I think consolidation of training is more cost effective and actually better to train with other agencies. So uh, I haven't bought off on it myself, but I'm only speaking for myself. So good point, thank you. Director Bernstein. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to echo uh, Rob Solano's comment here because um, he, he's been on the fire board longer than I have, but uh, I've been on long enough to have seen the drawings of a training center. And I don't know that it's still in the works, and I certainly don't support it. But one of the, um, 
one of the considerations that was on the table was that the firefighters should be training to do the things that they would be doing in Menlo Park. And to the extent that buildings are getting taller and going to five stories and six stories, there was talk actually, we got drawings of a five or six or even seven story building training tower. So uh, Madam Mayor, um, I know you live behind it, but I think this bears watching because sometimes these things get out of control and uh, I, I for one don't have control over what the whole fire board does, but th there are issues that residents are, should be watching and be concerned about. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on C2? We'll move to C3, which is the Caltrain grade separations. I'll, I'll, I don't have any Chief, great way to you, tee this up. I know this was a conversation we had uh, during our agenda setting portion of our last board meeting, and I had chatted about it with the city manager, and it was just a kind of an interest on an, an update about what's going on related to the grade separations, and I think we can have the conversation continue from there. Great, now I, I could provide a, a quick overview for Menlo Park. Okay, great, yeah. So the um, city council recently did uh, select uh, or, or re reiterated its uh, preferred alternative for, for Menlo Park, which includes uh, four crossings. So it's uh, Raven, Ravenswood, uh, Oak Grove, Glenwood, and Ensignal. So for the uh, Ravenswood, Oak Grove, and Ensignal crossings to uh, pursue a, a grade separation that would involve raising the tracks and lowering the roadway. And then for uh, Ensignal, there would not be a, a grade separation. So that's that's the reflection of the what's called the project study report. That's the um, uh, preferred alternative. The city council did say, take some time to see if there, there should be a fully elevated option and decided not to pursue that further. So um, the, ne the next phase would be working with Caltrain on the uh, environmental review, the, the next level of, of design. Uh, this is a, you know, a long-term project, um, hundreds of millions of dollars type of project, but we are, the city is looking to pursue the, the next step, which would involve uh, environmental review. So this is, that's, that's the uh, plan for those four crossings. Um, it's a little bit more complex beyond there in terms of uh, Caltrain now embarking on a process to look at um, grade separations system wide. I know that there there's a recent meeting uh, last Thursday that I think the, the mayor was in attendance on. She may be able to report on that more specifically. So there's uh, issues related to Caltrain's electrification, which should be in place by 2024 with more gate, gate time down. Um, there's a uh, high speed rail at some point, potentially in the future. So there's other uh, rail issues along the corridor. Uh, a couple other things I could just speak to about the rail corridor is the middle uh, undercrossing. So that is a, a high priority project for the city recently um, passed a hurdle of being able to acquire the adjacent uh, property uh, to uh, accomplish that design still multiple steps working with Caltrain on the uh, on the design construction. So that's still a number of years years away from fruition, but is uh, making progress. And then the last thing I just point to is the, um, there's been a lot of talk recently along the rail corridor about quiet zones. So that's also been something of discussion, which would, for Menlo Park, involve um, um, uh, focusing on the uh, Ravenswood and Oak Grove crossings for a full quad gates at those two locations. So that's kind of a quick overview of the, the rail corridor, the, the main rail corridor, the Caltrain corridor. We also do have a separate Dumbarton corridor. It's not, to, not as active as right this second, but maybe at some point in the future. Vice President Bloom. Yeah, I just want to ask a question. When you, when you talk about grade separation and you know, raising the the road serve the tracks lowering the road service are you used to thinking something similar to like the holly street crossing down in san carlos is that a fair comparison to it's just just so i know what you're talking about yes we do generally kind of i do point to um the san car san carlos and belmont examples and when you uh, mentioned uh the holly street i did get a, a nod from uh, 
our team in the uh, audience that that would be appropriate uh, example. Thank you. Any other comment, Director, Director Bernstein? I just have a question. I don't understand if, if there's going to be grade separations, why there would have to be these quad gates um, for the quiet zone. So I speak. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Director uh, Bernstein, just uh, making sure following the protocols. So I, I think that's a matter of the time frames um, in that um, the quad gates are something that could per, be pursued more uh, more expeditiously uh, compared to the, the grade separations, which would frankly be almost decades, decades it, it, down the road without without the, the funding for that. So it's uh, it's um, been expressed by a number of um, residents brought forward to the city council. And so the city council happy to kind of they can speak for themselves as it relates to that but i think it's that uh, time frame uh element that um that the, that uh, quiet zone could be accomplished uh, in the near term just a follow-on question there real quickly um i i see what you're saying but w when do they envision the increased volume of trains uh the increased volume with the electrification should be by the end of 2024 Any other comments or questions from the fire board? Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor Taylor. I just wanted to shed some light on the meeting I attended last week. So I'm the um, council uh, designate for the local policymaker group for Caltrain, which is a group of basically every city that's along the Caltrain tracks. And there was a workshop held um, last week at Palo Alto City Hall, where we um, were exploring um, the kind of a vision that Caltrain has of corridor-wide um, policy. Um, and the concept was, what if Caltrain said, because of the increase in trains coming with electrification, and then they also have a 2040, I think 2030 or 2040 business plan to send even more trains down the track. So the amount of downtime of the gates are gonna um, be almost more than half of every hour. Um, and so just with that gridlock in the city. So the kind of the assumption at this meeting was it's, it's not, this is not codified at all, but let's just assume that at every crossing it needs to be grade separated or basically shut down. Um, and so kind of three options, either grade separated like Holly Street, completely shut down, so no travel through at all, or um, kind of mini grade separated for bike and ped access. And so in that kind of proposed vision, they took the Menlo Park preferred option, um, which currently is grade separating three out of the four of our crossings. So Ravenswood, Oak Grove, and Glenwood would be grade separated and Ensenal, which is the one that we did not select, would essentially be closed, either become a bike ped crossing or just completely closed. And then for Atherton, who has two crossings, currently they're both at grade, they would be grade separating um, the Fair Oaks Atherton Avenue crossing and then closing Watkins, which is closer to Menlo Park. Um, that concept um, came as a, <laughs> Um, it wasn't totally met with excitement um, by everybody, um, having the realization that um, they might lose access through towns. And so Caltrain is, like I said, that's not a codified policy. Um, so they're exploring whether that high level policy even necessarily makes sense for a full quarter wide policy. Um, so I just wanted to shed light on that. And then Caltrain is also part of these discussions also about um, quarter wide grade separations is also kind of like how to look at going about grade separating the corridor. So currently kind of every city is on its own and kind of the wild west in terms of um, coordinating with Caltrain, trying to get their funding on their own kind of really going city by city. So one city might go up, another city might go down, kind of a roller coaster effect that we hopefully won't be seeing. Um, versus on the other end of the spectrum, 
kind of forming, let's say like a JPA and all of the cities agree on kind of one um, corridor wide um, thoroughfare for Caltrain, um, which would kind of take away more of the local control and be more streamlined, um, especially to go after large chunks of money, which could be upwards of like $11 billion for the entire corridor. Um, or, and then there's a middle point, which is kind of like us um, knowing what each other's doing, working together, having standards, but kind of going our, on our own too. And so that hasn't been kind of designated by Caltrain either. So a lot of these conversations um, are fluid. Um, so, um, but like city manager Murphy said, um, this um, grade separation topic, unfortunately, I feel like should have really been decided and constructed you know, 20 years ago to prepare us for the increase in trains that are gonna come, which are really gonna impact emergency response times going across the city um, you know, next year with electrification. Um, but they're happening now. And so, um, but the, the actual construction is really decades away. So just looping back with the quiet zone, um, we are currently um, gonna be going into final design for um, putting in those quad gates. Um, Cause if, you, if we get Ravenswood and Oak Grove um, having quad gates um, and some safety measures in place, then that's a risk assessment that's um, good enough in order to designate the whole Menlo Park corridor as a quiet zone. Um, that would be a huge safety enhancement at each of those locations. So um, I know Director Solano, you are offering money. So if you wanna offer money <laughs> for great separation of our gates, we'll take that too as a safety uh, feature. But um, that's kind of what I know about, about grade separation. So I hope that's helpful. Um, but kind of nothing's, um, in terms of the Caltrain quarter wide, nothing's been firmly decided yet. Thank you, Mayor Willison. I have a quick comment. Thank, thanks, Mayor Willison. So as this group continues to discuss what this might look like in the future, I mean, is there a timeline that y'all are thinking about? I mean, I know that in the past, the city's kept us informed about what's going on and, and I'm sure that'll continue to happen, but it, what, what are y'all thinking about in terms of timing and, and the rest of the process? So um, it's really kind of a high level um, quarter wide concept study and it should be wrapped up by the end of the year. Um, now the members of the local policymaker group for Caltrain, we are not Caltrain board members. So we don't really have any real authority. Um, we're more offering local perspectives on um, Caltrain related issues um, that sometimes rise to the level of the board. And then we do have Caltrain board members to participate in our group. And obviously Caltrain staff is involved in the local policymakers group. Um, the meetings are open to the public um, and agendized. Um, but if there's some better communication that you would like either at the staff level or at the council level with the fire district to keep you posted on all these rail related issues, because there are quite a few, um, we'd be obviously happy to share whatever information we have uh, with you. Thank you. Any comments from directors? Uh, turn on your mic, Director Jones. Oh. Please. Right. <laughs> Um, sure. Is that good? Okay. So um, the outcome, the expectation, I guess, for uh, C3 in terms of as it relates to the fire district, uh, is there, what is the expectation or maybe some uh, general thoughts that you, I, I think I may have heard one or two, but what is the overall um, you would expect from us on this particular item? or you might consider. Thank you, uh, Director Jones. Uh, Mayor Willison, do you wanna to respond to that question first? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so the the decision to send, you know, an exponential, I don't know if it's exponential, but a lot more trains down the tracks by the end of next year, um, isn't a, a decision that the city has made or that the local policymaker group has made. That's a, a Caltrain board decision. Um, so I think for, for the fire district, it's just awareness of what's going on. 
um, and knowing that, um, you know, we have identified, you know, we are as a council interested in moving forward with grade separation as expeditiously as possible. We're actually one of the higher rated, I guess you could say, um, jurisdictions to have, you know, grade separation happen. That being said, um, Burlingame is ahead of us and it's taking them, as City Manager Murphy mentioned, like, I think a decade to even get to the starting to think about construction and then they have the whole construction topic coming. Um, so I think it's just an awareness of what the impact is gonna be on cross um, town circulation and that we are also pursuing the middle Avenue bike um, ped tunnel as City Manager Murphy said, and hopefully that, hopefully, um, that can relieve you know, some, some circulation issues, but um, we, we know this is gonna be an issue and I don't know what more we can do about it. Um, I, get, I don't know if that question was for me or really for staff and what feedback, um, yeah, so. It's open. It, uh, Mayor Willison, it was a, an open question. Um, thank you, uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you. So just to add to that, as um, someone who previously a couple of years ago sat on the LPMG, um, is the, I guess my first question is, is the fire district notified? Are you aware of what the Caltrain situation, what the plans are? Uh, so the fire district has been part of these meetings. Uh, with Caltrans, uh, so I've actually been participating for the last several years and spoke on behalf of the district and updated the fire chief at the time. We uh, actually had a position uh, to obviously safety uh, obviously is to eliminate the crossings uh, so that we eliminate any hazards and so and also to, in essence kind of rip the band-aid off all at once and just do all the crossings either you know raise lower at that time. So that is the position that we took at that at that time, uh, but we have been par participating the entire time. Excellent, because the Menlo Park is in a very unique situation where the emergency access needs to go through town and Palo Alto is quite a few miles away. Atherton um, does not have the easiest crossings and they're also several miles away. So whatever happens to the grade crossing greatly affects emergency access, access from the freeways to the hospitals, everything that um, is happening. And they are talking about having longer times down with, uh, they've got a new system. I believe um, Mayor Willison may know more about this, but there was a new um, type of system for putting the gates down, which was going to require um, the gates would be down longer and certainly with more trains coming through, it is a significant consideration. So I'm very happy to hear that the fire district is regularly part of the meetings. Thank you. Director Bernstein. Yeah, I just want to add, the fire district has already assumed that the district is cut in half and we have doubled the number of battalion chiefs, so we have them on two sides, and we now have two uh, ladder trucks on each side. So we've assumed that there's no more passage east and west at all. I'll add on to that, Council Member Nash. So Chief Chapelhoman actually, in his infinite wisdom, actually um, created a second battalion for this east side. And so I don't know if Chief Lorenzo, would you like to kind of touch on the staffing for that and, and maybe let the council know how that's working because it seems to be working pretty well. And, and I mean, even through the pandemic, right? I mean, where it was, the traffic wasn't as bad, but the anticipation for, you know, needs were still there. But the two battalions, I think, have been effective so far. But I don't know, Chief Lorenz, if you want to give an update I, on that. Yeah, I think that's accurate. I mean, the way we've structured and we just recently moved uh, the ladder truck from station one on Middlefield up to station four on uh, August. So now we do have, you know, should we be cut off because of railroad traffic, we have access from our ladder truck in East Palo Alto or the one on Polgus, depending on where it is. And the same thing, the battalion is out of station six on Crane and, and then again, um, station two in East Palo Alto. So 
it allows us to plan for that. And it certainly has become more challenging and it sounds like it's only gonna be more in the future, but yes. Thank you, Director Bernstein. I just wanted to add one other thing, kind of a, a negative here. The fire chief back then was adamantly opposed to putting what he called a 75 mile an hour rocket 20 or 30 feet up in the air. He predicted that when it derailed, it would kill hundreds, if not a thousand people in terms of high rises located right adjacent to the tracks. He considered it a major, major danger. And I just, I don't know what your zoning is going to be. I don't know what kind of protections there are going to be, but his feeling was there was no question there would be an accident and many, many people would die from it. So it is a major safety hazard, at least it was in his opinion. Any other comment or questions? Thank you. All right, um, now we will jump right into C4, which it sounds like we've actually discussed a little bit. Oh, Could we Councilor do a, small, a short break yes. after we've been in session for two hours? Yes, thank you. We will take a 10 minute recess or five minute. Okay, <laughs> let's do seven minutes. <laughs>
All right. Having our city council and a fire board members return to our virtual and in-person dais. Vice Mayor Taylor, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you, Ms. He Ms. Heron, and welcome back, everyone. Our next agenda item is C4, Circulation, Safe Streets, and Primary Response. And President Corrali, did you want to kick this discussion off? Sure. So this is a topic that has been um, floating around for a few years, and so this is something that we wanted to put on the agenda um, as y'all move forward with, you know, looking at how to improve the safety of your streets. And I, I actually asked for this agenda item because of, I just wanted to give y'all an update on what was happening with um, the county and uh, near this district, uh, not just it's fire station for the Alameda de los Polgos and Santa Cruz Y issue uh, that Mayor Wollison and I were um, on the county task force uh, for about five years. And so I think there was a final proposal that um, was brought to the, um, well, it was the task force's final recommendation, which I think helped take input and created a plan that everyone could agree with. So I think based on what I have heard, um, is that they're going to continue or actually do a pilot project, even though there was a pilot project in place right now or in place beforehand. Um, they're going to, I don't know if they're going to continue this with this new configuration, but in any case, the point is, is that during this time, the um, fire district worked very closely with the county to make sure that there was access for our, or little, no access, no impediments for our um, fire engines to you know, go on Alameda de los Polgas or Santa Cruz because their primary response route. So as y'all go through your process, I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of keep, you have y'all keep things in mind that, you know, the fire district is is here to, to support you, but also, um, you know, that we have a real purpose in making sure that there's emergency response or timely emergency response. So I, that's maybe the best way of kicking it off um, because I know that you're dealing with El Camino and now, now middle field. And so my, my thing has always been to have open communication and understand that, you know, we do have primary emergency response routes that go to Stanford hospital and sometimes into Sequoia hospital, you know, from different parts of the district and that there could be, you know, problems if we don't get to, a, to per, a person or an incident in time. So I don't know if Chief Lorenzen wants to make a comment on that. I'll, I'll offer a couple of comments. Interesting. Um, yesterday, as I was just walking to the Safeway from my place, I cut through the parking lot at Cook Seafood and out onto the sidewalk and almost got run over by a bicyclist coming down there. And I'm like, oh, like, I'd say it's something I get used to, but along El Camino, people ride their bikes on the sidewalks because there's no bike lanes and it's safer on the sidewalk. But so I guess my, my point is, is I understand the balance, right? And I mean, that was the, the majority of the public comments were just about that, recognizing we have a need for expedient response times and there's a need for safety. And I, I think my point really is, is just that we want to continue partnering with the city to make sure that we can make our streets safer and that we don't impair our ability to respond timely to those calls that really require it. And I don't want to say that every single call requires that we get there instantly, but there are, I think the ones that really matter are the ones that matter. When a, a partner or a child's not breathing or we have a fire where truly seconds can matter. So um, I will say my experience here that I think in our very first conversation we had, my had, had city manager Murphy was my first reach out when I got here. And I remember walking up to um, El Camino and talking about traffic and bike lanes and not really understanding what the issue is. And now having been here for a while, I understand. And I also appreciate the partnership, you know, case in point, as you all are embarking on the pilot project of the restriping on Middlefield, right in front of our fire station, your city manager reached out and had a conversation with me. And then your staff had a conversation with Chief Johnston uh, always cognizant of the impacts that it's going to have on us on our response times. And it was explained in such a way um, after conferring with a fire marshal and your staff that we're like, okay, this feels, um, feels collaborative. We understand what's happening there. It doesn't initially feel 
like it's going to have a significant impact on us and we'd be happy to give you feedback over the course of six months. And we reached out to the whole department to let them know and please uh, get back to us. So that, that right there, uh, we value. Uh, and, you know, it's interesting having driven through all parts of the community, some of the, some of the things that have been done in the past, you know, on traffic calming measures are not great. And, you know, our, our hope is, is that we don't repeat those and that we continue to work with current city staff to ensure whatever we do to um, make our, our community safer, our streets safer, that we do it together. So I think that kind of constitutes my comments on that. And I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Does anyone have any follow-up questions, city council members or fire directors? Director Solano. Thank you. I will be short. The, uh, as long as the city, which has worked with our, our fire marshal, John Johnson, uh, as long as we're working with them uh, with these safe bike, bike routes, because I get to, I'm a bike person and I'm scared to death as some of the areas in Meadow Park that I have to ride my bike. Uh, I did some research <laughs> before the meeting about that in San Mateo County, there is 1,275 bike accidents. And of that, about 1,100 were injured and there were nine fatalities last year. I, I mean, that's quite a bit of people getting injured. So I don't know how how we make those, those safe bike routes. Uh, and as the chief just said, you know, I don't, you know, people are riding their bikes on the sidewalk. I can understand why, but uh, I don't ride cross town anymore just because of that. And uh, there's just something about blending vehicles with bikes kind of scares me. <laughs> That's all. But as long as you're working with John and the, and our senior staff with that, we could work together. So thank you. Thank you, Director Solano. Are there any other questions? Follow-up questions? City Manager? So uh, Vice Mayor, yeah, so not necessarily a question, but it, um, it this may be an opportunity for me to uh, call on staff. The city is pursuing a local road safety plan. And so it might be a good opportunity um, to just uh, brief the uh, uh, district board on that plan that's going to be uh, conducted over this next year because that may be opportunity to collaborate on how to improve some of these safety issues. So I'll call up uh, Hugh Louch, our um, assistant public works director overseas transportation. Hello, hi, I'm I'm Hugh. I'm the assistant public works director for transportation, and yeah, we are um, uh, pursuing a local road safety plan actively right now. And uh, Mr. Johnson has been involved in some stakeholder meetings for that project um, already. That'll be ongoing. Um, and so, the purpose of a local road safety plan is really to look kind of comprehensively at um, how uh, what the safety issues are in our streets. Uh, and then to design a set of strategies uh, that really respond to those specific safety issues. Um, and maybe kind of a unique feature of the plan that's a little bit different uh, from how we traditionally address safety on streets is instead of just looking at, we have collisions in certain areas and kind of chasing the collisions around to where they are, look at what parts and types of infrastructure we have that lead to collisions, and then look where else we have very similar infrastructures. We call that kind of like systemic safety, um, and then be able to think about more kind of comprehensively how we design our, our streets to really address those issues wherever they are, um, just because obviously when you have a collision, and, and you all know this probably um, better than anyone, you know, a lot of times the difference between uh, you know, uh, a non-injury or an injury or a fatality is really just how quickly you can get there. And so if you can design our, we can work on designing our streets so that, um, you know, you're less likely to have those situations that cause collisions in the first place. It's really, um, I think, helpful uh, part of the whole um, chain of events. So we're very much relying on sort of um, a new, I'd say, federal framework that's called, uh, you know, kind of uh, 
uh, safe systems approach where you're thinking about what are the comprehensive set of things that go into uh, leading to safety on streets um, and then using that at the local level to identify what those solutions are. So we're, we're kind of at the stage where we have a bunch of sort of issues and challenges identified and, and have some data and information based on actual uh, crash records, um, you know, that the police collect. Um, and then we'll be using that then um, in the next few months, uh, along with public outreach to identify what our um, next sort of steps and solutions are. So if there are any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Louch. We have a question from Council Member Dorn. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Louch. And just to confirm, those are uh, using crash records for bicyclists, motorists, as well as pedestrians? Yeah, that's correct for any collisions that occur um, on streets. Thank you. I have a follow-up question. It, does, the does the data say how many pedestrian and bicycle incidences? So that means bicyclists hitting pedestrians. Um, so anything, what I would say is the data have any incident that's been reported to police and where they've taken a, a crash uh, report for it. So um, inevitably, there are certain types of crashes that are less likely uh, to have a crash report. Um, uh, we are using other kinds of data, sort of, you know, kind of big data uh, sources to try to fill in some of the gaps. That particular gap that you're mentioning is a particularly challenging one probably to fill. But if there are, to the extent that there are kind of police reports on that, yes, they would be included. Thank you. And, and uh, just a follow-up, is there opportunity to actually observe, if there aren't any police reports, is there opportunity to actually observe certain intersections? And I say specifically Chilco and Hamilton because bicyclists do not stop at the stop sign. Um, or if they do, I don't see them. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. That's a great question. I mean, that I would say um, whether or not it's in the context of a particular plan, that's obviously something we can look into. Director Jones. Um, more of a clarification, and Chief, you can kind of help me out here a little bit. Um, how, how would you um, identify and maybe quantify the the uh, standards that we set for ourselves in terms of having a, the um, a speedy res response time? What, what, I mean, where did it come from? And how how do we maintain or exceed our those levels and just for clarification you're asking about where we've developed our response time standards is yes. that it yeah. okay so uh we have a couple one uh that director solano had referred to a little earlier was that question about the county having a response time standards for, for us it's actually six minutes and 59 seconds 90 percent of the time on our ems calls that's a requirement. It's kind of in conjunction with AMR, the private ambulance company's response. So that's a county standard that they've established. We also have internal response time metrics. I don't think that have been formally adopted by the board, but we do attempt to have a similar response time, you know, 90% of the time, seven minutes or less. The um, Usually what that does is it, it allows us to measure proper placement of fire stations and proper staffing of personnel based on our calls. Not every call needs a seven minute response time for us to be successful, but um, that's just a general industry industry standard and it includes both what we call turnout and sh or shoot time, the amount of time it takes from when the bell goes off in the fire station to when our wheels are rolling and then the travel time to get there. But Usually that is, like I said, a good measure of our deployment strategies. And, uh, you know, you will find in some um, urban jurisdictions, they have response time standards that are five minutes. They're almost impossible to meet, but like a New York City might have something like that, but they also have firehouses much closer together. But I mean, that's the basis of it. Uh, one is uh, by the, the county's requirements. Another is by National Fire Protection Association. NFPA has standards. And uh, as I said, in the past, during our standards of cover studies, they've had recommendations for response times. I don't believe that uh, they've been formally adopted, but that's something we'll be coming back to the board uh, with hopefully in the next year. And as a follow-up to that, what, do you, what would you consider are some impediments to 
uh, the speedy res response time? Expedient, well, our, one of our biggest issues right now is traffic. Um, you know, then it, uh, beyond that, it's going to be just, it's going to be our geography, you know, the way we're spread out over our district locations, you know, of the call and proximity to fire stations. Uh, some occasionally it's going to be having multiple responses occurring in a sector, a station sector at the same time. So you have to respond to second in engine. So it's challenging to meet the response times then, but that's generally what it's going to be. Time of day sometimes has to do with it also both during the daytime with traffic at nighttime with waking staff up and getting them rolling. They don't roll out of the station quite as fast as they do during the day, but those things all impact our, our thing. And what does, um, how does street configuration, um, you know, uh, just street conf configuration uh, have, I mean, how much of an impact is that that really have on, on, well, the, on the time. Yeah, if if you're talking about, usually, generally our challenges with street configurations have to do with if there's any calming measures, speed humps or bumps um, uh, have some challenges. If you go into, it's fortunately it's the unincorporated area around station five in Fair Oaks, where they have uh, so many tiny little roundabouts, it really, really negative imp impacts our ability to respond quickly just because you can't navigate the streets more than 15 miles per hour. So that's a significant challenge. Um, you know, traffic signals, signals we have um, traffic interruption devices that we employ wherever we can with cooperating jurisdictions to help us via GPS change the lights green in our direction. So there's some things we can do to help us in situations like that. But, you know, virtually anything you do to a street in the form of putting parking on or bike paths or stoplights is going to generally slow us down. But, yeah, that's it. A part of it is, is city planning, too, and public safety that goes along with that. Are certain routes more uh, prone to, do, I, I know we have certain map out certain uh, routes that we want to take. Are, are some routes more prone to more of a problem than others based upon whatever calming or non-calming systems that are put in place? Yeah, and I'm having been here a short period of time and never having to have responded, I would imagine that answer is yes and that you know, part of um, the probationary period is all of our new firefighters have to memorize every single street in the entire district, the dead ends, the cul-de-sacs, the everything. I don't, yeah, I don't know how the brain can absorb and, and retain that much information, but they do also along that have in the, in the back of their minds, our primary response routes, those that are most expedient, you know, uh, those that are going to get them somewhere in the quickest amount of time, especially if they're moving from you know, if station one on Middlefield needs to respond to a structure fire in East Palo Alto, they know in advance, based on the time of day, which route is going to take them there the quickest. They don't depend on a, a GPS machine to tell them that. They they generally know. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, since 1975, I did some quick research. The population of San Mateo County has grown 20%, so says the internet. And, you know, that's not crazy growth, but I'm curious how the fire district is thinking about growth and changes in this area and what that might mean for the kind of infrastructure that you all invest in. Um, you know, does that mean that smaller trucks could be used to respond to medical issues as opposed to the large fire truck? Or I'm just curious if there's any implications for growth that you all are thinking about for the infrastructure you all invest in. Thank you. Sure. Uh, that's a great question. And, and it's something we think about, uh, and I'll kind of address it in two parts. That question came up earlier about smaller apparatus. And that's, you know, as a fire chief, that's a question I get asked often. Why do you send the giant fire truck on a medical call? Um, and, and the reality is, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, at each one of our stations, we have three, uh, people staffing it, uh, 
you know, and, and when they respond, they respond as a unit. The, the challenge is, is if we were to respond in a smaller unit that didn't include or carry everything that we need for any kind of call, you know, we might end up be out on, on, on a medical call in a, in a small unit, get a call for a fire, get released from that scene and have to travel back to the fire station to pick up the truck that has the hose and the ladders and the pump and the water. So we usually, um, in most cases, travel around with that, that big toolbox that's ready for whatever call comes next. Well, that said, um, we do have one smaller unit that's uh, a rescue. It's, it's like a two-person fire truck that's a little bit more nimble, a little bit more agile and able to maneuver through smaller streets, but it's an auxiliary unit, not the primary response unit. Um, back back to the other question about growth, and, and probably the biggest impacts that growth has had on us has been traffic and trying to navigate, especially from west to the east, you know, when uh, pre-COVID, when everybody was in the office, and it could take 45 minutes to get from Middlefield into East Palo Alto. That's something we've been cognizant of, and, and as Director Crawley had mentioned earlier, we've moved some of our staffing around to not only deal with the challenges with Caltrain and rail traffic blocking us off, but also having kind of a, a split between the east and west sections of our district just because of traffic. Um, the other thing that we do generally is um, just to monitor and ensure that we have proper staffing and proper deployment of resources is we'll monitor response times to see if there's any degradation in response times. But that's generally our, our best metric that we can use to determine whether we're deployed well is to develop those response times. And we always, uh, as a rule of thumb, measure them at the 90th percentile, not the average, uh, but so that 90% of the time we recognize that we can meet that standard and then the, the other 10% is for outliers. Um, so, but that's generally the way it's done. And those, those are the practices that we've employed. And, you know, moving forward, we don't know what, where the population is going to be or what it uh, looks like here, but we are always looking and trying to figure out where the next opportunity is to enhance services too. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Director Solano? Just think of a fire truck like a big tool chest. That's how, when I first came on the board, that's how one of the battalion chiefs explained it to me when I did a ride along with them. Mayor Willison, do you have any questions? Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. Um, I think um, some of the points that were made about shared values and safety and collaboration um, to me are really important and that we're all focused on um, safety um, in addition to emergency preparedness being one of our top five council priorities. Safe streets is another one of our top five council priorities. And to Mr. Louch's point, um, the fatality rate depending on speed um, rises exponentially. So someone traveling 20 miles an hour has a much higher chance of dying in a collision versus someone traveling 35 miles an hour. And so I think um, we're really trying to look at our streets um, to have kind of a vision zero mentality to, um, I guess, reduce your business <laughs> of having to respond to traffic collisions and fatalities on the street. I think that that's the way we really see it. And um, in terms of bike lanes, um, so, so when I'm thinking about emergency response, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile kind of gridlock and traffic kind of when fire trucks are stuck versus traffic calming when, uh, tra when the fire vehicles are kind of moving very quickly and then need to go over maybe a speed table um, and I'm, I'm any more clarity on that because I'm seeing if, if there's free, if, if fire trucks are moving quickly, um, then, um, that's one thing, but if, if it's gridlocked and with the gridlock situation, I actually see a lot of our buffered bike lanes really aiding in, um, emergency response, uh, circulation because, um, uh, because there are no parked cars on the side of the street, 
um, vehicles can move over to the right um, and bikes are very quick at moving over to the right um, uh, or able to move over to the right. And so to me that frees up space um, for emergency response vehicles. Um, but I, I think it is important to note that, um, you know, a lot of attention is given to um, increased um, firearm fatalities among our youth. And only in the last year or two have firearm fatalities taken over um, traffic fatalities. And so um, I think it's just really important to center the conversations around street safety and um, to the point that, you know, folks are riding on some of our um, arterial roads today, um, whether they're on the sidewalk or they're, you know, um, you know, in, in the street with cars, um, I feel responsibility um, to make it as safe as we can for, uh, for users. And I also feel like congestion and, um, you know, we have state mandated housing goals and, um, you know, we are going to see like all cities on the peninsula um, and I know the other cities in your jurisdiction as well you know we're seeing more um, need for additional housing and so um, so traffic and people are an, an inevitability and so I think there's a lot of um, places around the world that have tackled these issues um, with a common um, mission like we've been talking about and and figured it out so um, I'm committed to collaborating with all of you. Um, I'm really happy that our city manager reached out to Chief Lorenzen um, ahead of the middle field um, restriping pilot. Uh, I find that very encouraging and looking forward to having a lot more conversations um, about how to keep our community safe. Thank you, Mayor Willison. Are there any other comments or questions? Directors? I, I just have a quick comment. I'm going to piggyback on Mayor Wollison's comments. I think, well, she and I served on this task force that the county put together. And I think for me, the big lesson was um, that there was constant communication between all of the agencies. And in the end, what I thought was, um, and not just me, I think the whole task force unanimously voted on a specific plan that met the needs of as many stakeholders as possible. I mean, I guess in some ways, the perfect plan is like the imperfect plan, right? Because you're not going to meet every single need 100% of the time. But I think that the plan we had um, was was good at the very end, and, and hopefully it'll be adopted by the Board of Supervisors. But my, my message here really is that we should have um, constant communication and be included. I mean, sometimes I think in a good way, emergency response is taken for granted. Sometimes there's like, oh, people forget. And that's good because that means we're also doing a good job of, of being there. But also, you know, people think that, oh, there's nothing wrong if, if the street is, you know, not conducive to our fire or our equipment, you know, to go down the street in a, in a safe way without actually ruining equipment that can cost about a million dollars per like fire engine, for example. But um, as Mayor Wollison also expressed, you know, this, this growth and development within the cities and especially in our fire district, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a blessing and, and it's a curse too. I would just ask that when developments happen, like with the ADU laws or the SB9 laws, you know, that kind of thing, um, with setbacks or anything that would increase traffic or it might be a risk to our response time that we just kind of be kept in the loop and that we're included in the discussion so that we can work together. Because the more people you have, I mean, the higher the probability that there could be an accident or an incident, right? And so, and we have to provide this service. I mean, it's our charge, it's our mission. And in some ways, we're kind of like the insurance, right? That, you know, you need it when you need it. And when you don't need it, you know, thank goodness you don't need it, right? But at the end of the day, I think that people expect us to provide the service, the level of service that we've been providing, and we want to continue to do so. So my my only hope is that we'll continue with open communication when you see that there's going to be, um, you know, some growth. Like your the housing issue is a big deal, right? I mean, we know that, and that's gonna, like I said, create other issues. So just keep us in the loop. And we're asking this for all of our cities, not just Menlo Park, you know. So we'll be 
I think we've talked about this with Atherton and um, we'll obviously share this with East Palo Alto, but that's, that's my hope is that just include us because I think the expectation is there for us to provide the service that you know, everyone could need at some point. Thank you, um, President Corrali, and I am sure we will do our best um, to keep uh, the fire district in the loop um, on policy changes in Menlo Park that will definitely impact um, traffic or even our population. And on that note, any questions, last minute questions or comments from anyone? Council Member okay. Doerr? It's a pleasure to spend time with you in this space, and I'm really grateful for the chance to meet all of you. And I'm excited for these potential opportunities to continue the conversation, talking about the after action report and other efforts to improve safety for all our residents. So thank you. Any final comments? Well, I just wanna thank the Menlo Park City Council for meeting with us today. And, and I'm sure we'll probably have another meeting as well based on our conversation tonight. And I look forward to that. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. And I look forward to our continuous communication together. And this meeting is adjourned. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, we actually have a closed session item that we do need to take care of. We can't excuse the fire board for this. This portion. meeting is not adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> you thank you. Me. Well, the next item on the agenda is item D1, the closed session. Ms. Heron, can you please call public comment for our closed session item number D1? Yes. Thank you, Vice Mayor Taylor. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to provide comment on item D1, closed session conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code 54957.6 regarding labor negotiations with SEIU um, and AFSME and confidential employees, if you're participating virtually, please engage that hand feature in the bottom of your screen. If you're calling in from a landline or a cell phone, please press star nine. If participating in person, please complete a speaker card and return it to me at the clerk's desk. This will be the final call for public comment on our closed session item D1. Seeing no hands or cards. Uh, Vice Mayor Taylor, you may continue. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Um, at this time, we are going to adjourn to closed session. The City Council will adjourn to this special meeting and reconvene in closed session. The closed session report out, if any, will occur at the June 13th City Council meeting. Thank you. <laughs>